morning, members. We will call this meeting of the Senate Labor and Industry Policy Committee to order. Today is Wednesday, March 16th. It is 8.30. Uh, we have two bills on the agenda today. Uh, first one is Senate File 3413. I will move that uh, Senate File 3413 is uh, before the committee. Um, this is one dealing with uh, manufactured homes. And uh, um, I will let the, the testifier go into the details. He uh, can explain that much better than I can. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, Mark Bruner, uh, Manufactured Modular Home Association of Minnesota. The MMHA was formed in 1951, and we represent uh, manufactured modular home builders, and manufactured home installers, as well as uh, the voice of the uh, nearly 1,000 licensed manufactured home communities uh, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Rarick for bringing the bill that addresses the shortage of licensed manufactured home installers in the state of Minnesota. There are about 70 of them currently licensed in the state. What the bill does is uh, allow uh, already licensed residential contractors <clears throat> to also uh, install used manufactured homes. Under a federal requirement, a, manufa a new home needs to be installed by a licensed manufactured home installer. Uh, used manufactured homes are regulated by the state. So what the bill does is allow any of the 11,000 licensed contractors in Minnesota by taking three hours of education uh, as, as prescribed by the uh, Department of Labor and Industry to then install used manufactured homes which will free up those licensed installers to focus on new manufactured home installations to assist our uh, the four plants that we have in the state of Minnesota uh, currently building manufactured homes. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that the bill does is allow it's in addition to a uh, <clears throat> HUD label on a manufactured home to verify the date of manufacture to also allow what's called a data plate on a manufactured home which is inside the home when selling a used manufactured home. There's a notice of compliance form that's required in the state building code to sell a used manufactured home which is sort of the default safety standard for each new home and the, the other provision in the bill allows the, the data plate as well as the uh, <clears throat> HUD label to be used as verification that the home was built under the uh, uh, standards of the, the manufactured home. And then the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the other item would just be the, uh, an amendment that would allow the uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> manufactured home uh, or the applicant for the uh, manufactured home installer sort of verification to take the uh, three hours of continuing ed, defining that that has to be the qualifying person. So it's adding a reference to what a qualifying person is, which is defined already under the contractor licensing statute. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, bill, and there's been no opposition. And we worked with the Department of Labor and Industry on, uh, on much of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruner. Um, and yes, members, we have an A5 amendment uh, for the bill. And um, I, will, I will move adoption of the A5 amendment. And as stated, um, in the Housing Committee, uh, two issues were brought up. One was, what is the definition of a qualifying person? So the amendment gives a reference to that definition. And then also, um, there was no effective date excuse me, which would have made for the second section of the bill, um, which would have put it to August 1st, which would go beyond uh, the construction season, the busy construction season. So this makes it uh, following enactment. So both parts uh, would go become right away and help out for this next summer season. So that is what the A5 amendment is. Are there, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the A5 amendments signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. Are there any other questions from the committee for um, the testifier or the chief author? 
Or is there anyone from the department who, oh, there we go, uh, Senator Isaacson. Hi there, sorry about that. I'm uh, managing family stuff at the same time. Uh, so, uh, real quick, now is there, um, you had said that it's going to take the responsibility of used, putting in used manufacturers home or pre-owned ones and put that on the local contractors and that frees it up so that people that put in the new homes can be more focused on those. Is that what I understood you say? Mr. Bruner? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Eisen, yes, the, the intent is that to allow, uh, you know, contractors who already are able to work on, on used manufactured homes doing uh, modifications, uh, alterations to uh, install used homes. Currently under state law, only a licensed installer can do used, used homes or pre-owned homes and new homes. So the intent is that this would free up those licensed installers who are required under the federal code to do new home installations uh, to, to focus more on, on the new homes and sort of, if you will, expand the, the number available to do the used homes. Senator Isaacson, follow up? Oh, nope, that'll be fine. Thank you. I have to make sure I understood that correctly. All right. And is there anyone from the department that wishes to make any comments? I am not seeing anything popping up. Um, members, if there are no other questions from the committee members, I would uh, make the motion that Senate File 3413 be recommended to pass and be sent to general orders. Any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That passes. Thank you, Mr. Bruner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> all right, our next bill in front of us is Senate file 3881, it is the agency bill from the Department of Labor and Industry. And I believe we have uh, Commissioner Robertson with us to uh, begin the presentation. Is, she, is the commissioner not on yet? Not yet. Oh. Uh, is there someone else from the agency who would like to uh, begin the presentation with maybe a section there. Familiar yes, with. good morning. Good morning, Senator Rarick. This is Nicole Blissenbach. I'm the deputy commissioner here at the Department of Labor and Industry. I am checking in. Um, the commissioner is supposed to be here, so I was checking in with that. But um, until I hear, I suppose I, we could get started. That would be great if, if you're prepared to uh, do that. Great. Um, I believe uh, Josiah was going to be sharing some slides. There we go. All right, there we have it. Hmm. All right, and it looks like it's still in notes view. Is that what everybody else sees, or is that what I see? Oh, no, it went away. <laughs> but you were correct, that's. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get this down. There we go. There we go. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for inviting the department to overview the governor's um, budget recommendations for the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, we are pleased to be here today. I know I am accompanied by a number of individuals from the department and uh, I will rely on them if any uh, questions come up. So happy to be here and thank you for allowing us to present today. Next slide. All right, I'll start by going over the agency operating areas. And if the commissioner does jump on, um, somebody can just stop me and I'll hand it over. But um, so just as a reminder to the committee, DLI's uh, mission is um, in a number of operating areas. Uh, we have workers' compensation, which ensures appropriate benefits are delivered to injured workers efficiently and at a reasonable cost. This division strives to create an environment where injured workers uh, promptly receive benefits and services and where the system operates efficiently and cost effectively. 
We also house Minnesota OSHA, which helps keep Minnesota workplaces safe and healthy through separate compliance, which are workplace inspections and investigations, and consultation services, which are free voluntary workplace safety and health services. So the two separate Minnesota OSHA units here at the department. Um, we also have apprenticeship, which promotes and facilitates the development of quality registered apprenticeship programs that help employers recruit, train, and retain a highly skilled and diverse workforce in Minnesota. Conducts compliance to ensure protection and advancement of apprentices training in their program. And then finally, the, the fourth operating area here at the department, oh, sorry, I'm actually not at the end, CCLD, which, uh, which is our construction codes and licensing division, uh, protects public health and safety through the enforcement of a reasonable and uniform construction standards, focused on improving efficiencies in the delivery, inspection, permitting, licensing, and other construction regulatory services to industry stakeholders. Our dual training pipeline program supports employers in building their own dual training programs, strategically combining related instruction with on the job training to ensure a skilled workforce. Targets four high growth industry sectors with limited experience with Minnesota's registered apprenticeship system. Those four areas are advanced manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare services, and information technology. We also have our labor standards unit here at the department, which protects workers and promotes compliance through enforcement and outreach about wage and hour and employment laws. The youth skills training program, which supports the development of partnerships between the education and employers to provide students 16 and older with classroom instruction, safety training, and paid work experience in high growth, high demand occupations. Grant money is available for partnerships to create and implement youth skills training programs throughout the state. These locally developed programs are approved, supported, and monitored by the Department of Labor and Industry. And finally, the general support unit here at the department performs functions, um, including communications, financial services, human resources, legal services, outreach and education, research and statistics, and our combative sports. Next slide. Labor and industry's base budget for fiscal year 22-23 is 234.2 million. Of the 234 million base budget, only 7.96 million is general fund. That goes to labor standards, IT modernization, um, and that IT modernization money ends in fiscal year 23. The majority of the funding comes from the workers' compensation and construction code funds. This pie chart shows expenditures by program. Um, work comp benefits and CCLD are the largest expenditure areas accounting for more than 50% of total spending. All right, I won't go into too much detail on this chart. We can go into the next page. So budget change items. The Walls Flanagan budget to move Minnesota forward invests in working families and supports a skilled workforce. DLI supplemental budget proposals reflect these priorities. The first three initiatives um, that I'll present are being introduced as separate bills and as such are not included in the DLI supplemental budget as supplemental bill draft. Nevertheless, they are key priorities for the administration. So the first of those items is recognizing frontline workers. The governor recommends $1 billion to provide payments to frontline workers who have sacrificed during the pandemic to keep Minnesotans safe, healthy, fed, and cared for. This proposal would provide $1,500 payments to an estimated 667,000 workers, including health care, child care, school, grocery store, food service, transportation, building service, public safety, retail, and manufacturing workers. These frontline worker payments recognize the essential work of Minnesotans who have risked their health and continue to provide the vital services needed to keep our state running during the pandemic. Next slide. A comprehensive paid family and medical leave. A comprehensive paid family and medical leave program would provide Minnesotans with economic stability, boost the economy, help retain workers and recognize that People need to be able to take time away from work, to welcome a new family member, care for a sick loved one, 
or recover from an illness or injury without losing their wages. Proposed funding of 536,000 in fiscal year 23 and 995,000 in fiscal year 24 and 25 for DLI would address education and compliance costs of the program and the information technology system upgrades. The governor also recommends funding for the safe and responsible legalization of Canada, cannabis for adults in Minnesota. An annual appropriation of 121,000 to the Department of Labor and Industry would be used to support employers in the legal cannabis industry to build their own dual training programs, which combine structured on the job training with formal related education in the statutorily allowed industries, advanced manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, and information technology within DLI's dual training pipeline program. I'll briefly, so now I'm moving into the bill. Um, I'll briefly summarize the article one of the bill, which includes the proposed appropriations to the Department of Labor and Industry and get into greater detail in subsequent slides. So article one, section two, subdivision two includes the following labor standards and apprenticeship appropriations. 1.059 million in fiscal year 23 for the labor education and advancement program or LEAP grant. 316,000 for two additional apprenticeship positions, including a director of apprenticeship. 1.758 million for prevailing wage enforcement. 196,000 to strengthen fair labor standards for agricultural and food processing workers. 1.367 million for enforcement duties regarding earned sick and safe time. Section two, subdivision three includes 747,000 for youth skills training grants and program administration. Section two, subdivision four includes 150,000 base appropriation for the Office of Combative Sports. And finally, article one, section three includes 51,000 for funding for, or in funding for MMB related to earned sick and safe time. Next slide. In it, so this slide um, addresses our proposal for increasing equity and in apprenticeship. The governor recommends a 1.375 million operating increase to grow registered apprenticeship in Minnesota and train, reskill, and upskill the state's workforce. A 1.06 million increase to the Labor Education Advancement Program or the LEAP program will support and better facilitate the participation and retention of women, people of color, and indigenous people in registered apprenticeship programs. The employment in careers that pay a family that and employment in careers that pay a family sustaining wage. The remaining 316,000 would support two new positions within the apprenticeship unit, including a director of apprenticeship. In total, the request would fund three new positions. Presently, a single, individ, a single individual directs both registered apprenticeship and the labor standards program. Due to significant growth in both areas, each unit needs its own director to achieve statutory objectives. Minnesota has experienced growth in apprenticeship program over the past several decades. In 1997, Minnesota had 4,667 apprentices. Today, Total Apprenticeship Minnesota reports or today, Apprenticeship Minnesota um, supports 11,003 registered apprenticeships or apprentices in eight different industries. There are 194 active apprenticeship sponsors and more than 2,300 participating employers. Those numbers will only grow given the demand for skilled workers. Funding used to provide 200,000 that was split between the two organizations, while current funding levels split 100,000 between five organizations. DLI currently receives 100,000 from the Workforce Development Fund each year for LEAP to distribute in grants to five organizations for amounts ranging from 12,000 to 30,000 per year. Current grantees have expressed that the funding is insufficient to establish meaningful program to support women, people of color, and indigenous people 
in the registered apprenticeship program opportunities. By increasing funding and broadening eligibility, the agency will award larger grants to more organizations, expanding LEAP's reach across the state. Funding will enable community-based and nonprofit organizations and tribal governments to implement services, supports, and programming to improve participation, retention, and completion of women, people of color, and indigenous people in high wage registered apprenticeship career opportunities. Uh, Deputy Commissioner? Yes. Uh, the commissioner is on. Would you like to hand it over? I sure would. All right. Commissioner Thank Robertson, you to you. Commissioner Robertson, are you able to uh, get on? Good morning. I am so sorry, committee. Uh, my sincere apologies. I was having trouble logging in, but I'm here now. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole. Um, if you would like me to jump in at this time and continue, I'm free to do so. Otherwise, uh, Nicole can complete the presentation and I'll be available for uh, questions or concerns. Um, I will leave that up to the two of you as to who uh, is best uh, situated to make the presentation. Okay. Um, all righty. Uh, Nicole, uh, let's see. I am ready to pick up. What slide is that? We are on slide 10, Commissioner. Slide 10, I, I am so sorry, group. Okay, but I'm here now. All right, slide 10, all righty. Um, <clears throat> Minnesota is estimated to receive a significant uh, investment uh, somewhere around $6 billion in federal funding uh, during the upcoming years. Much of it will be used for public infrastructure projects covered by the prevailing wage law. Prevailing wage exists in Minnesota to ensure projects funded with public money be constructed and maintained by the best means and highest quality of labor reasonably available and that persons working on public work be compensated according to the real value of services they perform. A proposed base increase of 1.758 million each year would fully fund the current prevailing wage staff employed by the department, as well as additional staff necessary to provide education and enforcement to ensure our tax dollars are not promoting exploitative practices such as wage theft. Next. The youth skill training program supports development of partnership among school districts, employers, and other community organizations to offer safe, healthy, and meaningful work experience to 16 and 17 year old student learners. The proposal increased grant funding by 500,000 each year and provides additional resources for staff needed to administer the program. By growing youth skill training, more student learners would be better equipped to enter the workforce and select a course of education to contribute to their career path and more employers will have skilled workers they need. Next. Okay, uh, returning to the language of the bill. Article two includes policy and technical language for the department's budget proposals. Section one, two, three, four, five, seven, and eight are technical cleanup to establish a separate division of labor standards and the division of apprenticeship. Presently, a single individual directs both registered apprenticeship and labor standards program. <clears throat> 
Due to significant growth in both areas, each unit needs its own director to achieve statutory objectives. Um, <clears throat> these programs were designed, were uh, combined um, about the mid 2000s. It was done so because each unit had seen significant contraction in its budget in the previous years. Due to that, the department was no longer able to fully support both programs individually, and therefore it was combined under single leadership. Today, after several years of continued growth, although modest, um, the growth has gotten to the point where it no longer benefits the units to be combined as a uh, single unit, and both units are in need of individual leadership. Section six of Article two expands the scope of LEAP grants to include facilitating not only the participation but the retention of targeted populations in registered apprenticeship programs. It broadens the grant eligibility to nonprofit organizations and Minnesota tribal governments. Section nine uh, broadens construction code licensing division to assist to assisted living facilities and section 10 include commercial energy code improvements which I'll discuss momentarily. Section 11 corrects an error from last session that continued fee reduction for licensing building permits and plan reviews for two years. While the fiscal tracking was correct and reflected the full 4.5 million revenue reduction for fiscal years 22 and 23, last year's bill language only addressed the license fee reduction. Section 11 of this bill provides extension for lower building permit and plan review fees as was intended by the legislature and labor and industry retroactive to October 1st, 2021. DLI has continued to assess the lower fees as intended. We appreciate receiving a letter from um, Chair Rarick and Chair Pratt and Chair Eklund, which agreed with this course of action. Section 12, Article 2 adds effective dates for the cleanup provision <coughs> within the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council bill passed earlier this session. The prior law, la, the prior law passed without effective dates recommended by the council and without the addition of an effective date of the day following final enactment. The provisions wouldn't be effective until October 1st, 2022. Next. Um, <clears throat> this proposal gives the agency regulatory oversight of assisted living facilities and assisted living with dementia care facilities licensed by the Department of Health. Assisting, assisted living is the only remaining type of housing in Minnesota serving vulnerable adults and not under DLI jurisdiction. The proposal would enable the agency to provide construction code reviews and inspections statewide to ensure these facilities designed for the elderly and vulnerable adults meet the minimum safety standards. Next, improving energy efficiency in commercial and large multifamily buildings. Since, 2020, since 2005, greenhouse gas emissions in commercial building sector have increased by 15%, particularly driven by higher heating and cooling demands caused by a change in climate. The governor recommends 145,000 every, every three years 
to institute an adoption framework for the statewide commercial building energy code that ensures all new construction and large multifamily construction is net zero by 2036. Next. Um, Article three of the bill provides for OSHA penalty conformity. This is a provision that's been part of the labor and industry legislative initiative for the past couple of years. As one of the core requirements of being a state plan state, Minnesota has to be at least as effective as Minnesota OSHA. We, we, Minnesota OSHA needs to align the penalties um, that fail to provide, the penalties issued um, that fail to provide safe and healthy workplaces for their workers with federal OSHA penalties. The governor recommend conforming with federal maximum penalties and tie in future penalties to inflation. Conformity would ensure continued funding and would encourage employers to continue to take workplace safety and health violations seriously. Failure to conform to the federal penalty structure jeopardizes the Minnesota state plan program. Next. This provision would expand and strengthen the fair labor standards for agricultural workers and food processing workers. Article four um, of the bill will also be introduced as a standalone bill so that it can make its needed additional committee, committee stops. However, it strengthens the fair labor standards for agricultural and food processing workers. The governor recommends 196,000 in fiscal 23 and 146,000 in years after to strengthen existing workplace protection for agricultural and food processing workers. So a greater number of these workers are protected and aware of their workplace rights. This recommendation is among those made by the Committee for Safety, Health, and Well-being of Agricultural and Food Processing Workers to improve housing, safety, and labor standards for those workers. Article 4 amends the Packing House Bill of Rights. It strengthens migrant labor and amends the recruitment in food processing employment statutes. The provision amend employee notice requirements so they are provided in a language the workers prefer. And it increases penalties for non-compliance and expands the department enforcement authority over these laws. Next. You've heard a little bit about the earn sick and save time. Article five and six are the earn sick and save time provisions in the proposed budget. This language mirrors the language of House File 7, uh, first engrossment authored by Representative Olson. The COVID pandemic highlighted for us how critically important it is for people to stay at home from work when they're sick and how important it is that in individuals have approved time off. Workers who go to work sick risk spreading illness to coworkers, customers, and the public. Too many Minnesotans don't have access to earn sick time and are forced to choose between going to work sick or not being able to um, make enough resources to meet their obligations. This proposal would ensure workers can accrue up to 48 hours a year of earned sick and safe time for when they need to recover from an illness, go to a medical appointment, care for a child during a sick closure, or get care or assistance for other medical needs, including domestic abuse, stalking, or sexual assault. 
a proposed $1.367 million in fiscal 23 and $3.72 million in fiscal 24 and 25 would fund outreach efforts, enforcement, and compliance activities. Next. Next, we have combative sports. Article 7 of the bill includes statutory changes to the Office of Combative Sports to better protect the combatants' health and safety. As with agriculture and food processing, this proposal will also be introduced as a standalone bill so that it can make the needed additional committee stops. The proposed changes improve the Office of Combative Sports oversight of combative sports contact tests. It clarifies grievance procedures, address inconsistencies in statutory language, and close regulatory loopholes that put combatants' health and safety at risk. A proposed annual general fund appropriation of $150,000 would supplement fee revenues to fully support the program operations. The changes include restructuring the advisory council to meet the current and future needs by decreasing the size of the council and giving the commissioner the ability to appoint individuals that have various areas of combative sports expertise, not just limited to boxing or mixed, mixed martial arts. It will improve the event security by requiring all combative sports contests have at least one uniform security guard or an off-duty law enforcement officer present to ensure the safety of staff, combatants, and spectators. It would protect combatants' health by requiring that an ambulance or two emergency medical technicians are present at all combative sports events. It will ensure contest promoters pay a proportionate amount in fee relative to event size by limiting the number of complimentary tickets that can be issued to 15% of total attendance. Closing the loopholes that allow individuals to avoid regulations and put combatant health and safety at risk by requiring that combative sports not directly regulated by the Office of Combative Sports be regulated by a third party to ensure basic health and safety protocol. Um, this concludes my presentation. And again, I do apologize for uh, my tardiness and my inability to uh, log in. However, um, this is the presentation that has been prepared. Myself and members of my staff are available if there are any questions or concerns. With that, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll sit for question. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, members, I, there are some uh, testimonial letters in our packets. And I think at, at this time, I would, we have some testifiers who are scheduled. I would like to get through the testifiers, and, and then we will open it up to questions, because uh, we may go past time as we talk about the bill and have, have questions. So I'd like to get our testifiers through first. So um, with that, first on my list is Adam Dunnick um, with North Central Regional Council of Carpenters. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, apologize for not being there in person. I would normally be, but I'm out of town for, for work, so I appreciate you accommodating me testifying from across the country. Um, I wanted to tell, uh, I'm Adam Dunnick, uh, 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 the Director of Government Affairs for the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. We represent 12,000 carpenters, millwrights, pile drivers, and interior system carpenters across the state. I'm here to testify today in support of the governor's recommendations that, uh, and for his budget, I want to call out three specific items. First, uh, prevailing wage enforcement, which is something our organization strongly supports as an important way to ensure that a good middle class wage and benefit package is paid for public works projects. Prevailing wage is a cornerstone issue for our union, and we appreciate uh, the governor 
calling that out and, and adding uh, ample support in his budget for what we know is will be a, a large amount of public works projects coming uh, to our state in the next few years. Secondly, uh, I want to talk about uh, support for apprenticeship. Our apprenticeship program has never been more full in the last number of years as we continue to recruit uh, future construction trades professionals. We uh, currently are over 2,000 uh, apprentices in our entire regional council. I, I know just recently I was gave, uh, got a report that in the Twin Cities alone, over 1,000 apprentices just in our program. And I know through other construction trades, uh, they're experiencing similar demands. So the resources that go for the department that help to administer the apprenticeship program support really important careers for our members and for the other trades. And then thirdly, um, I want to talk about the federal OSHA conformity piece too. That's something that we have supported for a number of years. And so we continue to advocate in support of that, bringing those, um, uh, that language and those, those penalties and those fines into compliance with the federal government is a good idea. It's good policy. And as an organization that is concerned about safety on the job site every day, it's something that is, is uh, timely and I think an important part of his budget recommendation. So those are the three parts we want to call out and support and I'm happy to stay and answer some questions or otherwise certainly in, in touch with the committee very frequently. I'll be back uh, in the state tomorrow. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, next we have uh, Sherry Hansen with the American Institute of Architects. Thank you for being here. Uh, please identify yourself and uh, begin with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sherry Hansen, and I'm the Director of Advocacy for the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota, which represents more than 2,200 architecture and design professionals in our state. I'm here today to offer specific support for Section 10 of Article 2 of SF 3881. AIA Minnesota and its member architects are committed to addressing the significant impact of the built environment on our climate. The built environment accounts for as much as 40% of carbon emissions and energy use. Making changes here could be the next big impact opportunity to make our state more energy efficient and energy independent. We're also experiencing a greater frequency of extreme weather events, which is already increasing costs and financial risks for all Minnesotans farmers, building owners, local governments, and residents. Setting specific energy efficiency targets like those in this proposal will help designers, developers, and building owners chart a course for a net zero future, something we desperately need. Accelerating the statewide adaptation and ad adoption of the most current energy code ensures that every community, developer, architect, and tradesperson is on a level playing field because better, healthier buildings shouldn't just be for some. They should be for all, and the building code is an important tool we can use to attain equitable access. The proposed standard would still go through the rigorous Minnesota code adoption process where Minnesota specific changes are made and stakeholders across the design and construction industry are consulted. We need to begin to address the very real impacts of the built environment on our changing climate, and these provisions will help us do that. We urge you to move this bill forward for adoption this session. Thanks for your time, and I'll be here for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Melissa Heising with Minnesota AFL-CIO. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Melissa Heising, and I'm Legislative Director for the Minnesota AFL-CIO, the state's labor federation of more than 1,000 local unions who represent more than 300,000 working people throughout our state. I'm here to highlight our strong support of several items in the governor's supplemental budget. Ensuring workplace safety for all Minnesotans is always one of our top priorities. According to the AFL-CIO's most recent annual report on the state of safety and health protections for America's workers, the national average penalty for a serious OSHA violation was $2,973. Minnesota's average penalty was less than half of that at $1,114, and Minnesota had the third lowest average penalty of any state in the country. Minnesota OSHA penalties have not been adjusted in over 20 years. As a state plan, we must be at least as effective as federal OSHA to maintain our state program. Conforming to federal law will ensure that we maintain our state program and federal funding, as well as deter workplace health and safety violations by employers. That is why we support raising Minnesota's OSHA pe penalties to conform to federal law and indexing future penalties to inflation. We also support the increase in funding for prevailing wage education compliance 
especially with massive federal funding for infrastructure coming to our state, it is important to ensure that funding creates jobs with family sustaining wages and increasing enforcement of prevailing wage will help do that. In the wake of a global pandemic, it has become clearer than ever that all working Minnesotans need to be able to take paid time off when they are sick, both to care for themselves and to avoid spreading disease and longer term leave to deal with a serious illness or to bond with a new child. Too many Minnesotans are forced to choose between going to work sick and not being able to pay their bills or worry about getting fired. Earn sick and safe time and paid family and medical leave will enable Minnesotans to take care of themselves and their families. Finally, bonuses for frontline workers are long overdue. Whether they were caring for COVID patients, stocking grocery shelves, caring for children, driving buses or processing meat, anyone who could not work from home risked their own health and the health of their families by going to work. Department of Health data on workplace outbreaks shows that anyone who worked with people outside their household was at increased risk of exposure to COVID-19. In addition to the risk they faced, these workers were forced to quarantine, often without pay, multiple times over the past two years. While a $1,500 payment won't make these workers whole for what they've been through, it is critical to recognize the sacrifices they made to take care of us and keep our state running during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Amy Lord with Independent School District 728. Good morning, Chair and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Amy Lord, and I am with Independent School District 728, and I am the Career and Technical Education Coordinator for our district. I am happy to be here today to speak in support of funding increases proposed by the Department of Labor and Industry for the Youth Skills Training Grant. I am actually a grant, we are actually a grant recipient of the Youth Skills Training Program, and I have seen several benefits from this program in our district. One, it has definitely built stronger CT internships programs for our district. Um, we started out with 30 students the first year, um, this year we have 60 students that are out in paid internships. Um, they've taken a related class in school through an elective through career and technical education and now are continuing their skills working in a paid internship out in the community with our businesses. Um, it not only increases their technical skills that they're learning, it also prepares them for their future with work references and they're learning employability skills that are so important. Um, next year, we project to have 100 students in our internship program. So it continues to grow, um, and that's how we're able to su sustain the program moving forward. It has also built strong relationships with our local employers. Um, we've improved our advisory committee members so that we're getting better information on how to provide classes so that students are really prepared when they're going out into the industry. Um, participation from our employers have been amazing. They have been coming in and speaking to classes, providing tours, providing donations. Um, and employers are super excited to have our students in their um, facilities um, working because they have new excitement is what the employers say and new passion um, that they don't normally see from some of the other employers that they're recruiting. So they're excited to train and help students learn on the job. Um, the other huge piece and benefit that we see is really student engagement. I wanna just share a little bit of a story. Um, Kellen, who was a junior a couple years ago, um, his father actually was a teacher in our district as well, had gone to his dad and said, I'm not loving school. And for a father in the education industry, that's a tough thing to hear. But what Kellen loved is he loved his robotics class. He loved manufacturing. And so we were able to put him into the internship program and connect him with one of our local employers that were able to really fuel his passion. Um, and for Kellen to stay in this program, he needed to improve his grades in his other classes. So his grades did go up um, and he continues to work at Meadowcraft. He graduated last year and he is now actually one of our mentors for some of our new students that are in this internship program through the Youth Skills Training Program. Um, we have also increased the number of industry recognized credentials that we've been able to provide to students. Um, before youth skills training, we did not do an OSHA 10 certification with our students. Um, industry said that's something that we'd request. It also aligns with youth skills training program, 
Last year, we had over 200 students get their OSHA 10 certification. Um, I just want to thank you for your support to help prepare and empower for our students to be successful in our workforce um, and provide additional training or resources and funding for the Youth Skills Training Program. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. <clears throat> uh, next, we have Dr. Barbara Doyle with the Urban League Twin Cities. Hi. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Um, as you said, my name is Dr. Barbara Doyle, and I'm the Director of Workforce Solutions at the Urban League Twin Cities. As you know, we formerly the Minneapolis Urban League. So I am really happy to be here today to speak in support of the funding increase proposed by the Department of Labor and Industry for the Labor Education and Advanced Program, which LEAP program in Senate File 3881. I can speak firsthand uh, to the benefits this program has had uh, for our community. As you know, for more than 90 years, Minnesotans have looked to the Urban League Twin Cities as a source of strength in the community, from employment to education to engagement, Urban League seeks to help people of color, women, and indigenous people in training and employment programs to strive for and achieve economic empowerment and self-sufficiency to build wealth that can be passed down from generation to generation. So why the LEAP program is so important the Urban League Twin Cities has had a long history of contracts through the LEAP program. And since I started at the Urban League, uh, not 90 years ago, but in 2016 to 2021, we've had 56 participants complete a pre-apprenticeship program and were hired by contractors and sponsored into union trades and placed in level of jobs at an average salary earning close to $20 an hour, it's depending on the trade. While we were able to change the lives of these people and help them with career pathway opportunities and learn, earn livable wages through the LEAP program, this is a small number. Uh, Urban League could only serve over these past six years as our capacity to serve them was based on the amount of funding we received we know the demand is there and people consistently come to the Urban League needing our services. And the number of requests continues to increase. Unfortunately, we have to turn them away because we don't have adequate funding. However, we need more solutions to the table and funding to address this issue. So expanding the funding helps organizations to increase capacity and the community could benefit as well. However, limited funding prevents us from providing innovative wraparound services and providing needed support services to participants such as uh, they need tools, uniforms, um, gas cards, helping with skills training, uh, minor car repairs to make sure participants are able to travel to work sites those are just to name a few. Now, as we're coming out of the pandemic, we need to recognize that more people are eager, eager to get back to work. And we need to be able to respond to the target population needing our services. Also, this increased funding will help address the needs of the increased number of people in our primary service area, the majority of them being people of color uh, more specifically uh, African-Americans. So in closing, we envision uh, a future in which African descendants of women, indigenous people can fully, can be fully engaged, empowered and invested in the success and well-being of the Twin Cities uh, area. So we believe that a strong and systemic change is needed to transform our communities. However, the lack of funding continues to be a major issue affecting our ability to 
provide quality and more effective service to the number of people requesting participation into the LEAP program. So thank you for your time. And uh, we're hoping that this increased funding will be a reality so that we can serve more people. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, that is the last testifier that I have on my list. So we will now go to uh, member questions and comments. Uh, I have an, a, quite a list, but I will uh, go to other members first if you wish. Um, uh, not seeing any immediate hands. Um, Commissioner, um, I guess one of the, the first question I would ask is, um, in total, how many new FTEs uh, would your department be uh, gaining um, with these proposals? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, give me just a second. I know I have that total number here. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll come back with that total number if okay. we can go to the next question. Yep, thank you. Um, Ms. Oh, go ahead. Mr. Chair, I have that number. It's 28.5 FTEs. Thank you very much. And so that would be spread out, I guess, as we get to different areas, I will probably bring that question up again. I know you talked about in the labor standards in the apprenticeship division, um, that's where some of those additions will be. And so we'll maybe get to where that breakout is uh, as we get further on into some of the questions. So, um, I'll try to follow the kind of the order that uh, we went in. Um, in regards to the frontline worker pay, can you help us understand um, what are the requirements going to be and how, like, is there a number of work hours that are going to have been required for workers? How, how is that gonna be verified and how do we verify that they were actually um, not a remote position? I, several of the classifications probably make it pretty clear, but is, is there something in there that you're looking at or the, the governor's administration is looking at and how that will be determined? Mr. Chair, um, actually the qualifiers will really depend on the final language. Uh, we've, had, we've had much discussion. Currently we're working with the Department of uh, Revenue and DEED to establish the parameters that will give us some opportunity to verify the information that would be included based on the um, based on um, the final language. I do have my deputy here who has worked very closely with establishing what those uh, what that criteria would be, and I'd like to ask her to join the conversation. Nicole, if you're available, I am deputy commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, Nicole Blissenbach, Deputy Commissioner with Labor and Industry. Um, so there have been a number of cri criteria discussed, uh, and that includes over the summer when the working group met um, with the Senate and the House uh, appointees to that working group. Um, but the, the language in that the governor is proposing would have a number of criteria that would include uh, working at least 120 hours during the peacetime emergency in Minnesota, in one of the identified uh, frontline sectors, which we um, went over when, when we went, uh, gave the overview of that portion of the bill. Um, it would also have some income limitations as well as uh, limitations on um, number of weeks that a person may have received unemployment insurance. Um, much of the criteria would be, um, so for instance, the income in the UI, uh, if, if it passed in the way it, it, in the way it was proposed, um, would include verification by using the deed and Department of Revenue database. Um, the application that we would be uh, pursuing as part of this would also require some 
verification by the individuals as well as in uh, we are looking into an ID verification to make sure that the person is who they say they are as they are filling out the application. But we are exploring a number of different ways and as the commissioner testified, um, of course, what that looks like in the end will depend on, on what final legislation will look like. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And I got just one quick little follow-up. As you talked about the income uh, limit, is that going to be considered what they're, like, say, if they're salaried or something? Or, yeah, I mean, if I guess my question would be is we have a number of people who probably worked a bunch of overtime uh, during this, and is that going to kick them out of the... Uh, because of the in, the limit on the income, will that kick them out of eligibility? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, for that question. Um, so that was a, definitely a topic of conversation. And as we were looking at what income limits make sense, and there is a different income limit for um, for married filing jointly uh, than there is for indi um, somebody filing single. Um, and the way the language is currently written is it also uh, provides a higher income limit uh, for people who are providing direct COVID-19 patient care. Um, so people like nurses who may have been working a lot of overtime would uh, fall under that higher income limit. Thank you. And then and one last follow up on that one. Uh, the 120 hours, that would be, uh, you know, three weeks. Um, I guess just wondering, you know, a lot of times we put on, you know, like the hiring bonuses, you have to be there for six months. Uh, can you help us understand why just three weeks that somebody might have been there for, you know, that short period of time and out and that would help them qualify, why it wouldn't be for a longer duration over the, over the, through the pandemic? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the 120 hours was a, a number that was um, decided upon because when thinking about the risk that the essential um, frontline workers took on, it didn't, the risk was really there regardless of how long they were in the positions. Um, the requirements in, required them to be working in person in close proximity to coworkers or the public, and that risk was present um, for those individuals, whether they were working 120 hours or much longer. So recognizing that uh, we were trying to um, give some recognition for the risk that they took on and some of the financial hardship they may have taken on by um, exposing themselves to COVID and their family members and possibly not being able to work for periods of time because of that exposure or contraction of COVID-19. Um, but of course, that, that number is, is also you know, up for negotiation as uh, we hope to see final legislation on this. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I know this is uh, this has been a tough area. Uh, trying to make this fair is going to be uh, virtually impossible. So we just have to come up with a potentially decent solution, I would say. So, uh, members, any other questions yet from other members, or I can continue on. <laughs> All right, um, uh, Commissioner. Um, when we talked with the, I mentioned it earlier, the, the labor standards and the apprenticeship division um, wishing to separate them back out again. Um, and we talked about the growing uh, in industry, the growing uh, of each part, portion. Um, how many FTEs would you be looking at uh, in each uh, division as compared to how many there are now? Okay, um, Mr. Chair, uh, one second. Uh, there will be a number in the prevailing wage uh, area. Uh, my staff will help me with that in just a second. Uh, that number is 10. So, so, Commissioner, that would be 10 total, and then do you know what the breakout to each, um, like the labor standards, and then the apprenticeship division would be? Okay. <clears throat> that would be um, three additional positions in the apprenticeship unit and 10 additional positions in uh, the labor standards unit. Okay. Thank you, 
Commissioner. And then you mentioned uh, the prevailing wage. Um, is that a separate um, area then and, and how many new FTEs would be there? Mr. Chair, um, the only addition in the Labor Standards Unit is for the prevailing wage so, um, investigators. Prevailing wage is a part of the Labor Standards Unit. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. So those 10 are predominantly for that prevailing wage piece. Mr. Chair, that's correct. All right, thank you. Um, okay, then uh, the next uh, section that I had is dealing around um, the language for the corrections on the reduced fees. And I missed how, how I know we're going retroactive. How far out are we going with those reduced fees? Um, and is it possible as you look at that we could go like next year, consider going longer with those? Mr. Chair, the current reductions are for um, this biennium, so it would expire um, 2024. Um, we, we base the continued reject, we base the continued reductions on the projections for construction. Um, I don't know that we've looked past um, 2024 at this point, but it would be our intent that if the revenue source continued um, as projected, um, we would be willing to look at that. We are, um, based on the request by the governor's office, looking at what would it take to uh, continue to suspend um, license fees. So we're looking at this from a number of different ways um, in order to save our stakeholders dollars. Don't believe decisions have been made at this point regarding um, lifting the, the license fee costs altogether but we're pulling the information together to determine what that would look like. So bottom line, to answer your question, we are looking, the current reductions uh, will expire in fiscal year 24. And um, we are, we're continuing to look. Um, these, the, <clears throat> And we're also looking at um, suspending the license fees in, in future years out. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And so uh, next year, uh, we would be potentially uh, working with you again on that as we look at the next biennial budget. Okay. That's correct. All right, um, the next two are gonna be kind of related. Um, with the, the licensing um, around the, the safe housing and the elderly and the vulnerable, um, you're asking for that. Um, currently, that is over at, uh, done with, through DHS, and you're asking for that to come over to Dolly, is that correct? It's currently at the Department of Health. Okay. Um, um, Mr. Chair, I have a staff person that would like to weigh in on this. Okay. Uh, Scott McCowan. Uh, Mr. McCowan, I, please identify yourself and... Uh... Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, thank you for the question. My name is Scott McCowan and I'm an assistant director with the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, as the commissioner said, that the Department of Health started licensing um, assisted uh, living facilities um, last year and currently there isn't any construction oversight from our department on these licensed facilities, specifically the ones that are developed um, in outstate area with, where there's not code administration. So this would provide oversight on these facilities. All right, thank you. Um, so my, where I'm going with this question is, uh, we had a bill earlier dealing with radon and the department was opposed to taking that over. Can you help me understand the difference between these two, why you'd want one and not the other? 
Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is not taking the authority away from the Minnesota Department of Health. They, so the way that uh, the statute in 326B works is when facilities are licensed by another department, the Commissioner of Labor Industry has code oversight on the construction of these facilities. Currently, MDH licenses these facilities similar to a nursing home or a hospital, and they do some of their compliance inspections, which not to get technical, but with NFPA 101, which is just a, a different standard. They really don't do construction inspections during um, the build process. They use the NFP 101 at the end of it to certify the building to show that it's compliant more from a use where we would be doing um, oversight on the plan review and inspections like we currently do for hospitals and nursing homes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question I have is around the, the energy code uh, section and so if I'm understanding this correct, um, what we are looking to do is to have Minnesota move more quickly than the national standards um, to get to this net zero um, if the national standards aren't moving that quickly. I, am I correct in that interpretation of what we're looking for here? I don't know. Commissioner, if you know that or if you can hand it off to someone else. Yes, I'd like to hand it off to um, to Scott. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That is that is a correct comment. Okay, um, so then the, the follow-up to that, um, I know in a number of times, whether it be electrical code or other codes, um, when folks have come in at saying that the, there are provisions that maybe they don't like, uh, but the department has always been resistant to changing because on the national level, they bring together so many folks that work on this, develop it, they know where things are at in the industry. Um, why again would we move differently on this one than we have on others? I'm gonna have to uh, defer back and get back to that answer. I was, I'm not typically prepared to answer that statement incomplete, but I can definitely get you that answer. Okay, thank, thank you, I appreciate that. Sure. Um, oh, great, uh, Commissioner, uh, on the, was talked a lot about the OSHA uh, piece and the conformity, and I guess the one piece that I've, I've struggled with through it is we always talk about that um, we must be as effective as federal OSHA, and I, do, I don't interpret that as meaning that we have to have the same uh, fees and penalties, I take that as are we have to be as effective in making sure companies are safe. Does Minnesota have a higher rate of issues on the job um, and work safety issues compared to uh, states around us or have we been pretty successful with our OSHA programs here in Minnesota? Mr. Chair, Minnesota has been a leader in safety and compared to our surrounding neighbors, we are at least are more safe as they are. However, it is the Federal Department of Labor, Federal OSHA, that determines the overall effectiveness of the program. And measuring where the penalty structure is, is one of the criteria that is, is used to determine at least as effective as. So, I understand uh, what you're saying, but um, this is a standard that is applied across the nation and all state plan states are required to have a penalty structure at least as effective as federal OSHA. And to date, um, as you've heard in um, our testimony and the testimony of other supporters, um, Minnesota penalties have not been raised for nearly 20 years, and therefore we are considered out of compliance uh, with the provision that we be at least as effective as federal OSHA. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. And yeah, again, that's uh, it's one I, I struggle with. I not necessarily that I don't believe we could update, but. Uh, it just does seem with all the things we've talked about, uh, we have a great program, we are very proactive, we work with our companies, uh, have been very successful, and to me that we're more effective than uh, the federal OSHA is 
in a lot of areas and um, it seems like if we put the fees too high in my opinion it would make companies less willing to work with you and bring you on site to do those inspections to get advice and help to make it better um, so that's one we'll, we'll definitely continue to talk about um, the egg worker provisions um, the question I know there had been some talk about you know the a group a working group got together talked about this um, can you help me understand though if the egg groups were actually present through most of those um, working group meetings and if they were there when votes were taken? Um, Mr. Chair, I need some help uh, from my staff regarding the attendance of those meetings. Um, Deputy Commissioner Blissenblatt, I think can address that. Deputy Commissioner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I was a member of the Agricultural Worker Wellness Committee um, and the committee did have participation from um, employers. Uh, I, I don't have, I should have printed a list in front of me. Um, I know AgriGrowth was present on the committee, um, the Minnesota Farm Bureau, uh, number of other, I wish I could remember everybody off the top of my head, but there was uh, representation from, uh, from agriculture community uh, worker communities, as well as um, the Department of Ag, the Department of Labor and Industry, and, and DEED. So um, all of the recommendations that came out of that committee were um, unanimous from all of the voting members. Um, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. But the other part of the question is, were those Ag groups present at the meeting when the votes were taken? I would have to go back and look at the roles. I know at least some were. Um, I can't tell you that all of them were. So I could look at the voting roles and get that answer to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. The information I've received is that you had three uh, groups that represented them and none were present at the, the day when the votes were taken. So um, I know they are a little troubled when they hear that it was a unanimous vote uh, and none of them were there that day. It was. Uh, my understanding that that vote happened when they were right in the heart of um, harvesting. And uh, so that's that's a little troubling when we, we hear that, uh, we get two different sides. Um, another question, uh, Commissioner, uh, another one around the FTEs. Um, with the earned sick and safe time uh, provision, um, how many FTEs would be added to your department uh, with that one? Um, Mr. Chair, the number of FTEs for the earned sick and safe time is 10.8 FTEs. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And then is that uh, just in the preliminary and then are there more in the future coming or is that the total that you feel the agency would need uh, to run this program? Mr. Chair, it looks like in the outgoing years in fiscal 24 and fiscal 25, it would be 13.6. And so that would be in addition to the 10.8? The yes. All right, thank you. Um, and then uh, one last one on my list, again, kind of around the, uh, with, similar to the egg, it, when you, you have a lot of things for the combative sports um, were, was there a working group and were there uh, members who are currently involved in the combative sports arena that were a part of that as, as these recommendations came forward? Mr. Chair, I'd ask uh, Assistant Commissioner Prushek to address that. All right, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Kate Prushek and I'm an Assistant Commissioner at the department. Uh, yes, the Combative Sports Advisory Council was involved in the um, development of the bill. And in fact, um, some of the, the bill language is actually a recommendation of the Combative Sports Advisory Council members, um, in particular, providing the commissioner with penalty authority for those um, combative sports that are regulated by a third party you'll see that there are reporting requirements in the bill so that those promoters need to 
report suspensions to the department. That makes sure that um, combatants aren't competing in a third party regulated event and then coming to perhaps participate in a professional boxing or MMA event um, when they've had a had a suspension issue. So advisory council members thought it was important that the commissioner have penalty authority uh, just to be able to put some teeth behind that requirement. So that's just one example of the advisory councils um, weighing in on the proposal. Uh, thank you. And then I guess one other piece that kind of hit me as that was being discussed to, to understand if they weighed in uh, the 15% limit uh, for uh, the number of tickets that would be given out through a promotion. Uh, was that something that was agreed upon through promoters? Uh, or can you help us understand where that came from? We did not discuss that with promoters, but the intent is really to ensure that the fees that are being charged and the revenue that we're, collected is, that we're collecting is commensurate with the event size. Okay, um, would there be any potential um, ex exceptions for that, say a first time venue trying to get, um, you know, make people aware of what's happening? I know a lot of times that's what, uh, what happens. Uh, they'll give tickets away to try to uh, generate uh, interest in a new venue, um, things like that. Is there any potential uh, exemptions for that? Mr. Chair, the promoter would still be able to issue as many comp tickets as, as they would like. It would just, the calculation in terms of how the fee is calculated would limit would be limited based on um, that 15% limit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, members, has anyone else come up with any questions yet? Senator McEwen. Right. Oh. Okay, Senator Dornick. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just have a follow up to kind of what uh, on the earned sick and safe time that you were bringing up. Uh, so I'm not sure who the question goes to, but uh, like with the 24 new employees, uh, do we have a number of the uh, cost for administration, uh, the start date of the program, and then some of the payments? I know these are some of the details that uh, are out there a little ways, but uh, I'm sure that you've thought about those. So some of those uh, details, do we have those? Commissioner, do you have that? Um, the details regarding the administration, are you asking if there are additional positions for administration? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Mr. Senator Chair, Dornick. I'm asking the administration costs, the total kind of the cost. You have the employees that you're hiring, the new employees, but uh, just the cost of administration to implement this program. That's the first question. Commissioner. Uh, I, I need some help on that one. Christy, can you address that? Sure, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Christy Swanson. I'm the uh, Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, so for the Earn Sick and Safe uh, lead program, um, sorry, let me just pull up our documentation. Uh, so the total re fiscal request uh, for the for the Department of Labor and Industries administration of the program is uh, 1.26 million in fiscal year 23, and that would have uh, the 10.8 new FTEs in the first year. Uh, and so that administration is for uh, the FTEs um, and uh, outreach and education. Uh, the following year in fiscal year 24, uh, the cost goes uh, to 1.8 million. Um, and just a correction, it's a total of 13.6 FTEs from fiscal year 24 forward. It's not 10 plus 13. So it is a 13.6 FTEs uh, of ongoing op of staff operating this program at the department, um, and then the operating and costs associated with education, um, enforcement, uh, travel, uh, the IT costs to um, house employees at the agency. Sen Senator Dornick, follow up? Yes, Mr. Chair. So, do you have a start date that you're thinking um, to this program? <laughs> Uh, Commissioner, you got that one, or do you want to hand it off to uh, Ms. Swanson again? Um, 
Uh, no, I don't believe we have a complete start date at this time, but I see my deputy uh, coming on screen. Nicole, you have deputy more to commissioner. Add. Mr. Chair, um, thanks for the question. The uh, bill is currently written has an effective date as 180 days after after the bill is signed into law. Uh, so we would be starting our individuals um, at that point in time uh, to start with the outreach and or the outreach and education portion, um, and then the enforcement piece would happen later after we are able to um, to conduct our outreach and education uh, efforts. Any follow-up, Senator Dornick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. One one last question is, so how are the payment uh, schedule, how are they going to figure out the, the amount? Uh, Deputy Commissioner, do you want that one as well? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, although I may need to ask Ms. Swanson for uh, help as to the fiscal note where, where the money fell in. Um, but the the fiscal note does um, appropriate the money for each fiscal year and that takes into consideration the start date of 180 days after the bill was signed into law so if i could pass it to um, Ms. swanson that would be great Ms. swanson sure thank you um mr chair and committee members um uh, the, the specific question i apologize is what how do we uh, anticipate, how did we calculate the breakout by fiscal year? Mr. Chair? So actually just the, the payments per person when they have, you must have an amount to, that you're planning on or if you do it by how much they make or kind of the schedule of plan to, the actual payment to the, the person that's making the claim. Uh, assistant oh, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, I can actually yeah, answer Deputy that. Deputy Commissioner, yep. Okay, so you, um, Thank you. So your question is is actually related to the individual who is using the earned sick and safe time. Yes. Okay. Um, so, and I just want to make sure that we're clear that we're talking about earned sick and safe. This is different than paid family medical leave. So earned sick and safe time is uh, that bill allows for an individual to earn sick time based on the number of hours they work. And that is a benefit that is paid by the employer. It is not similar to paid fa it is not paid family medical leave which is a program that is set up like unemployment insurance is there a good senator dornick no oh, thank you uh, no further questions okay. uh, senator McEwen. thank you mr chair F1. I accidentally unmuted myself. Um, so I just have a couple of questions. Um, going back real quick to the, the OSHA issue, um, the need to conform um, with the federal OSHA, I'm wondering if there is a risk of not conforming with the federal OSHA, and if there is a risk, what, it, what is that risk? What are we risking if we don't? Mr. Chair, um, I, I'd like to address this, and if I leave anything out, I invite my staff to, to jump in thereafter. But the biggest risk is um, Minnesota is a state plan state based on contract and grant agreement. Failure to conform to um, the at least as effective as standard puts the Minnesota OSHA program at serious risk. What we know is that federal OSHA has begun to take actions against state plan states that have not conformed. Minnesota is not the only state that have not conformed with the penalty. I believe there might be a handful or more, maybe I think I've heard maybe um, uh, more than eight or something, something around there. But just looking at Minnesota alone, um, the risk is that uh, federal OSHA can take actions, including initiating actions to rescind their agreement with Minnesota to be a state plan state. We are aware that they began actions against two state plan states um, in uh, calendar year 2021. 
for both those states not conforming and adjusting not just to the penalties but there like, was also outstanding three four months ago so she was the, the risk is the great guest of SNL. Um, my we, daughter's been in we love have with received uh, a citation in our annual report that tells us how we're doing and if we're measuring up and um, we continue to receive negative connotation because of our failure to conform the penalty. Um, Deputy uh, Blissenblock, is there more that we should consider here? And we also have the OSHA director on the line. Jim, if I've left anything out, please jump in. Chair Rarick, I could just add a, a okay. few things. Yeah. Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. Um, so just to, to be uh, to give a little bit more detail, there are um, 11 states that uh, that have not conformed with the federal penalties at this point. We have received word from federal OSHA that um, we will have a finding in our report for uh, failure to be as effective as. And as the commissioner stated, the real risk to that is we are risking our state plan status. Um, we know that Federal OSHA has been more um, proactive on ensuring the as effective as with its state plan partners. So that's really the biggest risk. And we know that our state plan is incredibly um, good and we provide lots of um, support to employers uh, as well as uh, do our job to make sure that workers um, are safe at work. So working with employers, working with employees, um, we value uh, being a state plan state because of that. And this does put that state plan state status at risk. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kruger, any chance you have any anything additional you'd like to state? No. I, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Mr. Kruger. I am the director of OSHA compliance with labor and industry. I have nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator McEwen. Uh, uh, real quick, members, we are past time. We can go a little long. Um, we will end up laying the bill on the table today, and we can potentially take it up again next Wednesday, um, but we can go a little over being we have some questions. So Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Here, um, I just have one um, brief comment so that we can wrap up and not knowing exactly what will happen next Wednesday, I wanted to make sure to, to say this. Um, I am so pleased to see the earned sick and safe time uh, provisions included in this agency bill. Um, as some people know, um, we, we have passed earned sick and safe time, um, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul and also up in Duluth. And um, when we did that, there was a sort of, okay, how come we hadn't been doing that all along? Uh, we went through a, a process to do it and, and then we instituted it. And um, one thing I think that maybe has been missing a little bit from our hearing today is just the human factor of what earned sick and safe time really means for, for workers in Minnesota. You know, if you're a worker in Minnesota, unless you have some other guarantee of being able to take some sick time for yourself, um, you can be fired uh, by your employer if you leave your work because you're sick. There's no protection for people. There's no safety mechanism for people if they need to leave work for being ill. So their choice is either to stay and to spread their illness to their coworkers or customers, um, or to, um, to leave work and risk um, being unemployed. I talked to some um, people yesterday about this earned sick and safe time issue, and one of the stories that really hit me was um, hearing about parents um, who get a call from their kid at school who has come to the nurse's office sick. And uh, situations where nurses and teachers taking care of that child in that school um, have the parent tell them over the phone that they cannot leave their workplace. They cannot leave to come and get their sick child. So the school is... Um, left having to take care of that child and then send them home at the end of the day. And that child doesn't understand why their parent can't come and, and pick them up and that it has to do with making sure that they have an income um, to support the family and that there are bigger issues and forces at play. So this is just such a basic um, safety net provision. It's long, long overdue. And I, I really applaud 
um, the agency for bringing this forward and the administration for bringing this forward. I really, really hope to see it move forward in, in some fashion. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, members, we are going to um, table the bill for now. Um, we do, you know, we understand uh, the, there was some issues uh, getting the bill drafted and it got in late. Um, we're going to have a pretty uh, busy agenda next week, um, but we will definitely continue to work with the agency and have discussions and um, we will we'll continue to look at this and, and see what we need to do with uh, maybe getting moved over to jobs. It may stay in our jurisdiction. Um, we'll, we'll be determining that over the course of the next week. So um, with that, our business is done for today, so we are adjourned. <laughs>